I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee, and it's great to welcome everybody. And most of all, it's great to welcome my friend Winston Ma. The um, Winston, I think it's fair to say, is, is a man for all seasons. He's done so many different things. He's been an investor, an attorney, an author, and he's now a professor at, at NYU teaching about the digital economy. Um, he, in many ways, represents this generation of people who started in China, got their college, university education in China, came to the United States, and now play an important role in kind of helping Americans understand China and helping Chinese understand America. And in, in my view, an incredibly important role. But we're not here tonight to talk about that role. We're here tonight to talk about his new book, uh, the Digital War, How China's Tech Power Shapes the Future of AI, Blockchain, and Cyberspace. What we're going to do this evening on the East Coast is to have Winston give about a 15-minute overview of the book, book, whet your appetite for it. I'm going to ask him questions, and then you're free to submit questions. We've already got about 15 questions from the audience. So if I don't get to your question, I apologize in advance because we have a, already an overwhelming response to this topic because it is so, so current that when he started thinking about the book, you couldn't have possibly known how incredibly important it was gonna be in the years that passed from when you first conceptualized it. But it's wonderful to have you here. I won't go through your full bio, at first, it's on our website, so you're free to do it. But I had first met Winston when, at his last job, when he was running North American affairs for CIC, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of the People's Republic of China. And he was running all of North America for them. He then left there and has gone to, to doing good as opposed to doing well. So it's, it's, um, it's wonderful to have you. Um, this is, this is the book, um, and why don't you kick it off, but thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Steve, for the introduction, and uh, certainly, you know, I want to show the back, right, uh, because your name, Steve, is at the top of the burbs. Thank you for that, and um, that, that, that's right. We should probably read my blurb. The, 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 back of, the back of the book is, as the United States and China and this is a great promo for the book as the United States and China head down the ill-conceived path of digital and technological decoupling. The digital war must be read before these policies become irreversible. Winston Ma's insider view of China's digital de development takes the reader down a path too rarely tread by those trying to understand China. And that was, that's absolutely true. And what's quite, by the way, in COVID, what's been so much fun about rereading the book, so I've now been through it twice, is that not being able to go to China, I've I feel I've become somewhat divorced from the incredible changes that are going on. And the book really takes me back there. So it's second best to being there and seeing exactly what is going on, but it's still, it's a wonderful read. Thank you, Steve. So, so let me share the screen and uh, show the... Uh opening presentation. Yeah, it's all good. So, so let's get started. You know, as Steve introduced, you know, uh, my career past the last two decades was all about China-US cross-border. You know, uh, I was educated both in China and the US. And as Steve mentioned, uh, I would represent a generation of Chinese that had undergrad education in China and then uh, uh, advanced studies in the US. In my case, you know, I did semiconductor physics for under, under, undergrad, and then I also went to the law school at, at the Fuda University in Shanghai. And then in the US, I got to the Master of Law and also MBA. Uh, so, so I was a lawyer in both uh, China and New York. Then, you know, I also got to the Wall Street training, you know, mostly from JP Morgan and Barcap in New York before I went to work for CIC, China's Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, relating, to, relating to global investing. So it's all about China and, and the US cross-border 
opportunities and synergies. So it's a it's a it's a tremendous tremendous honor to be able to uh, uh, have this fireside chat with Steve, you know, at the committee for U.S.-China relations. Now, to put our discussion tonight into context, I want to ask the the audience one quick question. You know, when you think about China's internet economy, what would you think of? What's the picture will coming come to your mind, right? And for many people, probably they will say it's the WeChat, right? Uh, that, that's a good answer because it's a, it's a super app, you know, the most popular in China. You know, it started as a messaging app, just like uh, uh, Facebook's uh, WhatsApp, but now it, it becomes an ecosystem, right? More than just a messaging, instead you can do so many things without even leaving that platform. Or some people will say it's the single stay. Every year, November 11th, Alibaba, JD, you know, all the e-commerce platforms in China host this 24-hour shopping extravaganza. And this is the world's largest online shopping day, uh, beating the US Friday shopping, you know, the Thanksgiving Friday shopping and the Cyber Monday shopping combined. And not only it is the biggest, but it, it is also the most global because every year, you have merchants, customers, vendors from more than 200 countries participate in Singles Day. So, so for many people, right, this will come to your mind. Or uh, for someone with financial background like me, you will, some people will say it is the mobile payment because China is going to a cashless society. You know, uh, the, the mobile, mobile payment certainly changed China's financial system as well as the whole society fundamentally tremendously. You know, for example, you know, Tibet was the first province in China to reach 90% mobile payment rate. That, that means, you know, for all the online purchases, 90% were done by mobile. And, and the answer is, is the reason is quite simple, right? Uh, because in areas that without traditional infrastructure, the mobile, mobile internet and the mobile payment provide them a very convenient new infrastructure. And today, there are nearly 1 billion internet users in China, which means, which means the, the largest ecosystem in the world, because they are unified by the same language, same culture, and the same mobile payments. You know, they leave so much data on the platform that may, uh, on those mobile platforms, that China becomes the best lab for fintech applications. So for some people, you know, mobile payment will come to the mind. However, I would say these are all the screenshots of yesterday. Yeah, because today China's internet economy is much more focused on new digital technologies. Like what I what I used uh, my, in, in my book title. It's more about AI, blockchain, cyberspace than mobile internet a few years ago. So here's another question. What was the inflection point for that transition? This question will bring bring us back to 2017, when China hosted the historical match of Go Chess game between the best human player and the AlphaGo AI algorithm developed by Google and DeepMind. You know, the Google's AI played the world best human player in three games. And this game, was ripe with suspense and symbolism, right? You know, human versus machine, tradition versus modern, or intuition versus algorithm, and of course, East versus West. And on top of that, you could say it's China versus the US. Now, the significance of this game was, because, was that the Go chess game was viewed as so complex that no one believed at that time that a AI can beat human. You know, this theory goes that the Go chess game has more variations than the total number of atoms in the world, in the universe. So the machines can never learn enough to beat human, right? So this game attracted huge attention in China in 2017. Now the result was sort of surprising, but not very surprising. It was a three to zero straight win by the machine. And it sort of sent a clear message to the Chinese internet economy that 
people should not focus on mobile internet anymore. People need to focus on the new data technologies. And oh, just overnight, you know, every Chinese e-commerce e-commerce platforms, you know, internet companies, they start talking about the second half of the mobile economy era. You know, since 2017, the keywords are no longer mobile internet and user traffic. You know, the new keywords are data and intelligence. Right. Instead of mobile first, people start talking about intelligence first. And that was like the spring of 2017, right? Uh, maybe it was a coincidence, but in the summer of 2017, just a few months after this event, uh, China's government came up, came up with a super ambitious AI development plan. Among many things, the China government calls for industry investing in AI and vowed to become the, the, the global AI leadership by 2030. So to me, you know, that was the inflection point uh, of China's mobile economy. And it is also the start of the China-US tech competition. Now, so, so that's the background of, of my two books. You know, the, the China's mobile economy was published in 2016 and the digital war was published the end of last year. And the, the difference, and as I mentioned, right, is about the different focus. 2016, the focus was, was on smartphones, mobile internet, and user traffic. Now for December 2020, the focus is about new digital technologies like AI blockchain, focus on data and, and, and big data analytics, and also the, the, the global cyberspace governance. Yeah? Uh, so this is really the, the transition from mobile first to digital tech. Now, we, we just covered AI and the next area of China-US competition is blockchain. You know, uh, it, it's very interesting that China, after China prohibited all crypto trading in 2017, in, in 2019, two years later, Chinese President Xi actually had a speech calling for more research and investment in blockchain. President Xi declared that blockchain is a critical technology, you know, it will play an important role in the next generation tech revolution. And this remark represented the, the first major economy leader to endorse blockchain, you know, this High, this hugely hyped, but not fully proved technology in the world. Uh, that to some extent rep represents China's government's thinking towards new technologies these days. You know, even if a new technology is not yet proven, it is important for, to, for, for China to get onto it. So, so this is a new front in the country's growing rivalry with the United States. The, the, the real application out of blockchain is the digital digital currency? You know, China China's central bank is testing China's sovereign digital currency since last year, and which makes China probably the first major economy to introduce a sovereign digital currency. You know, so far no other major power is as far along with a homegrown digital currency as China, because uh, uh, because the, the China's central bank digital currency has been tested in many contexts uh, in many cities, including Beijing, capital city itself. Um, and, and it is expected that this year, the, the test will, will even go into more platforms, you know, more scenarios. So that's blockchain. And next is about the, the cyberspace. Uh, for the cyberspace connection, certainly 5G network is the most important one. And Huawei of China is leading that uh, technology. Now, it's it's very interesting. You know, this this is also an area of China-U.S. competition. Uh, we have seen uh, lots of uh, sanctions on Huawei, right, since Trump Trump administration. However, you know, probably very few people realized that the U.S. government is now fighting Huawei with China-style uh, tech technique, which is setting up a China-style sovereign investment funds in the U.S. Actually, not only one, you know, multiple. Uh, uh, you know, one one idea was to buy European 5G companies, you know, Nokia and Ericsson. 
another idea, you know, uh, was to set up a 5G tech research fund, you know, in, 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 the, in the order of multi million, multi billions, multi billions. You know, the idea is to promote uh, 5G technology research in the US that can provide an alternative to Huawei uh, uh, suppliers. Now, most of the interesting one is the Development Finance Corporation. You know, it was set up during the Trump administration. It has 60 billion, six zero, you know, billion uh, uh, cash. So, so it can really play a role there. And the, the, the idea is that, you know, DFC will promote global 5G infrastructure investments. And according to some media report, you know, they're even thinking about investing into 6G technology you know, ahead of Huawei. So, 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 so this is the, the 5G area, right? But, you know, the flip side of this is, you know, just like a US focusing on 5G alternative, uh, China is also focusing on become, becoming self-sufficient on semiconductor chip production. Uh, you know, just like the US needs to import 5G technologies, China imports a lot uh, in global in, in the global chips mar market, especially from the US. You know, for example, in 2019, China imported more than 300 billion worth of chips. That's about 15% of total China imports. Um, so in response, China set up a multiple actually, you know, multiple semiconductor focused funds. And the biggest ones, you know, it's called the big, big fund uh, is like $30 billion. And the idea, you know, just like a US tried to develop, you know, alternative 5G technology, China wants to develop independent uh, uh, chip production supply chain. Now, the example of this uh, is SMIC, you know, uh, uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, and Investment Corporation, you know, in, in Shanghai. Uh, now, a, you know, this, this, is a, this is a series of things just happened like 12 months. Uh, but it's really dramatic, you know, uh, so I, let's quickly go through this. So 2020, right, uh, after China sets up those semiconductor funds, SMIC in Shanghai, they received more than $2 billion investments from the China Semiconductor Fund, both from the central, central government fund as well as from the fund in Shanghai. And in the summer of 2020, it listed at Shanghai's star board, right, which is like the NASDAQ board of China. Valuation went, went up, everything was good. But soon, also, you know, just a few months after that, it was put on the entity list and the stock ban list by the US government, right? The, the, commerce, the commerce department has the entity list which limits SMIC to have access to American technologies. And the stock ban list was, what was developed by the US defense department uh, which prohibits U.S. investors from investing into the stock. Yeah. Uh, so as a result, you know, in, in, at the beginning of 2021, uh, SMIC uh, was delisted from all U.S. exchanges. You know, uh, earlier it, it, it removed itself uh, from the NYSE exchange, and at, at the beginning of 2021, even the OTC small <laughs> trading exchange. Uh, got it removed, and and uh, and more more importantly, uh, because it, it, it's a stock in many indexes, that also means it has to be removed from the index, triggering more selling from in index products uh, from uh, large uh, U.S. asset managers like a BlackRock, right? Uh, so the, so the impact is huge uh, for both China side and the U.S. side. So when you look at this example, uh, you can see that. Uh, for tech topics, you know, the sovereign capitals are getting in, uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the other side of the country will take action, right? Uh, whether it's SMIC or Huawei. Um, uh, and it's not only just the government, uh, because the implication also trickles down to all the, all the suppliers, to, to all the investors and to the, all the customers. So, so that's really, you know, the, 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 the digital war that we are talking about, right? Uh, now, as we, I close, as I come to, to the end of my opening remarks, you know, I, I show this picture. Um, certain, you know, that, that's when they, both uh, President Xi and President Biden 
were VP of China and the US, right? And now years later, they become the president of these two superpowers. You know, many people expect, were, were expecting that after Trump, we will see the end of the digital war, right? But it seems to be, it's, it's just the new start. It's, the, it's a new start for the next four years because uh, we look at the Biden administration, you know, in February, it just announced, it just released this executive order to, to reevaluate the, 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 the supply chain of semiconductors in the US, you know, trying to be less reliant on foreign supplies. And on the China side, right, just days ago, uh, last week, uh, China had the People's Congress and the, the State Council deliver the, uh, the, the government work report. And in this report, uh, China decided to increase IND spending by more than 7% per year between 2021 and 25 in pursuit of major breakthroughs in technology. So the, the digital war is really on, or you can say in general, the tech competition is really on. To, to have the complete story, you know, you have to read the digital war with my another new book called The Hunt for Unicorns, you know, how sovereign funds are reshaping investment in the digital economy. And the connection of, of, of these two, uh, as, as illustrated in the Huawei case and SMIC case, uh, is, is that China and the US are, are, in, are in this tech competition. And the front line of that competition is the sovereign investment vehicles uh, where the, the government capital uh, the, the government capital is becoming the new venture capitalist. You know, it, it can be it can be a huge, huge capital supply to the tech investments, but at the same time, it will also lead to profound implications, uh, as we have seen in the case of uh, Huawei 5G and SMIC semiconductor contexts. So, so with this, you know, I, 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 I pause here and uh, I give this back to Steve. Oh, terrific. I mean, that gives everybody a flavor. He's only covered a tiny percentage of what is in this, is what is in the book. Um, just a, a slight aside on this delisting. Delisting only matters if the company was in the process of raising capital. It doesn't yeah. hurt the company if it's not raising capital. I, I, I thought I heard you suggesting that actually mattered. My view of these delistings is it punishes the NYSE, it punishes NASDAQ, it punishes the American lawyers, accountants, and others, and really doesn't do much for the companies because they just issue in Hong Kong or in Singapore or in London or in Tokyo. Yes. Now, I, I think, you know, what, what you're saying is, 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 is one part of the story. So before the stock ban, you know, uh, when there was only the entity list, um, companies like SMIC or Huawei, you know, Huawei is not listed, but for SMIC, right, it, it, it was listed both in the US and Hong Kong. So you are right. Uh, when it was on the entity list, uh, they, you know, they, they, they can delist from, from New York, but they still have the Hong Kong, Hong Kong market for people to trade. Yeah. Um, so, but, but, you know, when the, the US Defense Department put the company's, the company's name on the blacklist, that means no US investors can invest in that company, even if it's listed elsewhere. So, so it's, it's like a two-step two step sanction. It's, it's very serious. And, and the third implication of this is, uh, if the company is significant enough, uh, which probably is true for all the companies on the, on the, on the, on the blacklist, you know, they are typically in the index of, of, of you know, of, of many index providers, right? Uh, so which means, you know, for US asset managers that provide index products for the broader market, for example, Blackstone, let's say, BlackRock, let's say, just, I may make this up, right? You say Asia tech uh, uh, ETF. That, that, that means uh, BlackRock cannot hold the stock anymore. So Black, BlackRock had to remove the stock from that ETF. But yeah. doesn't, doesn't the non-US financial institution then put it that, that, that investors go to non-US financial institutions to buy that ETF, which includes that company? That, that's, that's totally possible, Steve. You know, like a full for well, bargain hunting. Possible. I don't think it's possible. It's what's happening. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I say possible because on one hand, you know, the bargain hunting 
uh, as the owners uh, outside the U.S., you know, may take this opportunity to buy those shares, right? But as a, but uh, uh, you know, when when things snowballing, when it's snowballing, you know, don't you know the U.S. side is still has the most of the capital, so 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 the non-U.S. capital may or may not be able to take everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I have the same view of this mm -hmm. delistings as I do on the entity list. If the U.S. Mm -hmm. is the sole source of the technology or the chip, and we don't export it, that has an effect. But if there are multiple sources from multiple countries and those right. other countries are not similarly sanctioning, similarly preventing the export, what we're doing is simply diverting the export from the United States to the Netherlands, to Japan, to South Korea, to Singapore, that it's, 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 a, it's policies which just hurt America and do yeah. nothing for our policy. That, 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 that's that's true. You know, to some extent, it's like a, a tax shopping, right? People will move to the lowest tax uh, jurisdiction, yes. and here, you know, technology will can also flow cross border in a similar way. Talk about the implications. You talk about that digital currency, central bank digital currency. Talk about the implications of that for kind of the RMB globally, in and also the tech war, and then talk about. Um, you know, it's not blockchain. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's the opposite of blockchain, that there's no privacy for holders of Chinese digital yuan. So the central bank knows everything that's going on. So how do you deal with those privacy issues? And what does it mean in the tech war and the internationalization of the RMB? You're, you're, uh, you're absolutely right that it's not a pure blockchain. Actually, the, the official official description from the Central Bank of China is that the, uh, the, the, the China's sovereign digital currency is based on quote unquote blockchain-like technology. So, so it used some blockchain-like features for data management, but you're absolutely right. You know, in essence, it is completely centralized currency. It's, it's not decentralized as blockchain promised, right? Or Bitcoin promised. So, so it's totally different from Bitcoin uh, in that kind of contest. Now, uh, the implication to the U.S. can be pretty profound. Uh, not 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 because uh, it, it will make Remin be international international overnight because digital is not that magic, right? Uh, but but it may facilitate it may facilitate some of the uh, the trends that are already start that that have already started, which which means. Uh, uh, more foreign countries are, will, will choose not to hold as much U.S. dollars as 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 in before, as in before. Now, now for example, right? For example, uh, you know, China buys oil from Middle East. You know, at the same time, the Middle East buys Chinese consumer goods, right? Um, now, oil right now is priced in U.S. dollars, right? But for for the Middle East, you know, in the end, they're gonna buy Chinese goods. So, so people can naturally ask, right? You know, why do we still need the U.S. dollar in the middle? Uh, maybe, maybe we just use our own currencies for this thing. Uh, so, so this trend has already started, right? Uh, last couple of years, uh, because of many reasons. One, one of them is the, the U.S. quantitative easing, uh, which pushes pushes the U.S. dollar, uh, you know, to 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 this. Uh, to 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 the brink of, you know, kind of a crisis. You know, to some extent, the, the popularity of Bitcoin these days reflects that. But you know, if we focus on the China Middle East, right? You know, they would say, we we would, you know, for our trades, you know, we can just uh, uh, use our own currencies. And I think, you know, during for for this trend, the digital currency, because it, or because of its convenience, because because of because because of. It, you know, it can be integrated into into uh, cross-border e-commerce uh, smoothly. Uh, it, it can uh, accelerate this this process. You know, accelerate you know the non-U.S. regions uh, uh, using more renminbi than U.S. dollars. That, that's what I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the way, let, let me divert for a second. Yeah. Why? Did, how did you have Scaramucci write the introduction? He, obviously, it's it was somewhat unusual for a, a book about China <laughs> and China's digital uh, economy growth. 
Um, obviously, he had his moment, his 10 days at the White House, I think it exactly. was, in the Trump administration, and is now a figure in U.S. media. But how did that happen? No, thank, thank you, Steve. No, I, I, you know, so, certainly, not number one, right? You know, certainly, you know, the, his 11-day White House press secretary was part of the thinking, you know, of, uh, when I thought of him, uh, because uh, he he had the, had the had the dealing with Trump, right? You know, he had the first hand experience of of managing the country with with angry Twitters. So, so so I think you know when when I have him to uh, on the book cover, I, I want to send send a message that you know we're we're back to conversations. You know, instead of angry Twitters. You know, we, are, we, you know, the, the two superpowers can behave like adults. You know, go back to conversations. You know, that, that's one. Another, an, another aspect, obviously, is is because Anthony recently uh, became the uh, become a become a asset manager into Bitcoin and crypto assets, right? And for my book, uh, uh, you know, it ha my book has the uh, blockchain word in the title, and also I started chapter one with the crypto. You know the, the Chinese digital currency, so it, it's very suitable for a U.S. crypto asset invest investor to to comment on that as well. Um, Ryan Lewis at Middlebury asked something which I was kind of getting at in my initial uh, question, which was how does China's privacy protections or lack thereof impact the development of AI and cyber capabilities in China? What does this mean for the ethics of the issues and China's own capabilities. Sure. No, th this thing come up uh, come up a lot. You know, and I, I think for 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 most people, you know, uh, the the perception is that Chinese people Chinese users give up privacy for convenience, which leads to huge amount of data left on um, China. You know, left and collected by Chinese internet platforms, uh, which become a advantage for Chinese uh, AI companies. You know. Frankly, you know that that was the uh, uh, Facebook uh, Zuckerberg's testimony at the U.S. Congress, right? Uh, because uh, uh, Zuckerberg's the point Zuckerberg's uh, position was don't regulate us uh, because this will hinder our competition with Chinese air companies, right? But in in reality, uh, you know by 2021, you know China cannot be that that easy excuse for Zuckerberg arguing for less regulation. You know why? Because uh, last two, three years, there was a big shift in the Chinese users uh, uh, thinking towards data. Two, two reasons, you know, one, big data sometimes leads to price discrimination, right? That means, Steve, you know, if you use iPhone to order a airline ticket, you know, you, you get a high price quote then someone uses a cheaper smartphone yeah? because they, they get that they get get that information, and also is that the, true? Yeah, yeah exactly, oh, exactly. Wow. Yeah, oh. or you know, if you if you're booking a, a, a travel to Tokyo uh, from Shanghai, you know, you get a, a higher price quote than than you know a order from a, a more remote places. Oh, right? Our listeners have now learned how to save money. By you, you have to smartphones. <laughs> yeah, you have to, and then you use a new phone. And as a first-time user, you know they will recognize you as a first-time user. They can give you a better price, so you can come back later. Um, now, so that's one one side, right? The price discrimination, and another side is because of the, all the talk of uh, of data is the new oil of the new economy. Chinese people are educated that there's a value in data, so so naturally. All the users are demand a piece of the value of their own data. Yeah. So, so last two, three years, we see this big push from Chinese users, the individuals, uh, uh, for more protection and more control of their data. So, what we see right now is this bifurcation. You know, this bifurcation. You know, obviously, uh, the, the, at the country level, out of the national security, uh, the, 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 the government have access to user data. But at the, in in the in between the the the, the internet platforms and, and and the individual users, the Chinese government is has started a series of legislation to per, to 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 limit the power of internet platforms yeah. relate, uh, with respect to data collection and the data usage. 
But of course, in the case of the central bank digital currency, it is the government that has all the data. It is the central bank. Exactly. I mean, clearly, there's some wonderful things about the digital currency, including right. it, it, it should wipe, if it became incredibly widely used, it would wipe out corruption. But the privacy issues are extraordinary. The, the, it, it is. The government has all, they know all of you. They don't have to go to Alley or, or, or Tencent to find anything out. They have all the data themselves. That, that, that's, that's true. That's true. Is that a motivation for setting this up? Well, you know, I, I would say, you know, at the very beginning, they, they look into the blockchain and, and, and they feel, you know, this is a good way, you know, this is important technology to develop this new digital tech, currency as a way to be a leadership in this area. And, and as they develop this, right, they probably recognize that this is also a great way to, 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 to track all the economic transactions uh, and all the people activities in the, in the country. Uh, but, you know, like another way to look at this, Steve, is that, you know, that during the COVID, right, the, the country used Alibaba uh, Tencent uh, platforms to send out, you know, the, the health codes or, or to, or to uh, track uh, uh, people's, you know, like a, a location. Uh, so, 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 so in essence, right, these are all, uh, let's say, Data monitoring uh, in in the in the na in the national security contest. So so I think you know that's what the the government's position is, it, you know, this bifurcation of government monitoring all activities and and at the same time limiting internet platforms power over individuals. Yeah, um, Ni Ping asked, does the U.S. or China have the better political structure for technology development? Is there anything the United States should do differently, perhaps learning from how China's industrial policy has worked. Yes, yes. You know, Steve, we, we have seen China government put in huge commitment into tech revolution, right? You know, even, even before the 2017 AI commitment, you know, saying, you know, in 12, 12, in 12 years, you know, at the time, in 12 years, we're going to be the AI leadership in the world. You know, it, it, like uh, lots of countries talk about AI revolution, but you know, very few countries like China make that kind of commitment, right? And and develop a concrete plan for that. Uh, and I think you know that's probably something very different from from uh, between China and the U.S. You know, before the AI thing, you know, several years ago, uh, uh, twenty thirteen ish, right, when President Xi took office, uh, you know, the, it, it, he started this uh, information consumption information consumption policy initiative, uh, you know, which was the start of China transitioning from the old economic model, which was based on infrastructure investing and import export into the new econom economic model now, which is more based on consumption and innovation, right? Um, and we have seen this is the same initiative in, in blockchain 2019. And the last uh, last 12 months, obviously the, the, the main story is chips, right? You know, this government-led uh, uh, R&D investments, you know, certainly uh, it involves lots of waste, you know, in some cases even corruption, uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, it really creates that momentum to, to drive uh, research and investments in the areas that government feel it is the priority. So yeah. I think, you know, that's really so far, it's fair what's interesting. It's weird to say it's failed. That yeah. China's, you know, plan to to become self-sufficient in chips has not worked out. And not yet. Enormous. You are not talking about billions, tens of billions. Talk about hundreds of billions of dollars of waste exactly. that, could, that could have been spent elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think you know, the, the numbers are there. You're right, Steve. You know, I, I my under my undergrad major right was semiconductor. So, so, so my classmates, you know, they stayed in the industry and they're still, you know, like the engineers in Shanghai. So if you think about the money they put in uh, last uh, two decades, you know, it's truly about, it's like hundreds of, of billions of dollars size. You know, and, uh, and, and personally, you know, I, I, I think um, it is, you know, I, I, I want to quote like the President Kennedy talking about going to the moon, right? It is not because they're lazy. It is because it is hard. Um, so 
I think you know the the, the money obviously uh, had some waste there, but you know is, this is a, such a complex supply chain. Uh, so so you know if you don't put that kind of uh, uh, investment there, you know that you, you won't see you you don't you don't get any anywhere. You don't get anywhere. So so it's so yeah. I think you know it's still too early to 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 see yeah. whether it is the problem a success. Is the subsidies distort the global market, but the mm -hmm. U.S restrictions on chip exports to start the global market also. So it's correct. We're heading down a path that's-, that's Yeah, it, it hurts everyone. Yeah. Um, Tom Robertson at Microsoft asks, um, you know, China's, in, speak to the relationship between this innovation, China's indigenous innovation push and the possible restrictions that may be placed on the export of such technology, no, technologies from China in response to the U.S. government's export control restrictions. Yeah, you know, I, I think what we see is this uh, uh, regulatory escalation on both sides. Uh, you know, China, China is copying the, the U.S. side of regulations. You know, uh, to restrict you know cross-border investments, uh, to cross to to restrict export control. You know, the the, the latest application of the of this export control was in the TikTok cases. TikTok case, you know, uh, under Trump's executive order, you know, by the way, it is still effective, right? We will see how, how, how Biden's administration gonna implement it. Paid for 60 days. That, that's right, that's right. Uh, so according to Trump's executive order, TikTok's US operation must be restructured so that the US side will have the control of, of the data and the company. Um, now, in connection with this restructuring order, right, uh, the, the, a huge question was, what about the TikTok's algorithm, right, which uses big data to make users addicted to the platform? Because, you know, it analyzes people's big data and then keep feeding you the, the, the stuff that you like. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so there's a lot of value in that algorithm because it, is, it was trained by a huge number of users' data. Now, uh, China government came up with this export rule to say this is this this is the high tech of China. So this is subject to China's regulation. Therefore, you know, if you want to sell this to Microsoft or or Walmart or somebody else or Oracle. Right, we we must approve it. We must approve it. And to me, you know, Steve, I, I think this will create super complex situations for companies running businesses uh, in, in in multiple markets. Let's yeah. say Microsoft, uh, and especially for technologies that are trained uh, by data from both markets. Right. Uh, so so you know, the, the, in the case of TikTok, you know, essentially the algorithm is. is 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 maintained at the headquarters in Beijing, but it, it also uh, benefited from the U.S. users' data, and I can imagine a sim similar scenario that Microsoft, you know, had most its R&D in the U.S., uh, but it also get uh, got got the benefit of, of China of the researchers in in the in the Microsoft the China office or the or the or the user data of the China market. Uh, th this will create super complex issues for companies functioning in both markets. Yeah, they had obviously, it's all stayed now, but we'll see how it ends up. They had come up with a solution where Oracle controlled all of the US data. So the data right. never left the United States, the servers and everything else were controlled. But how did they then process that data in a way that the customers were still happy? Do we know how that was resolved? No, we don't. We don't actually, you know, that's really the uh, the crux of, crux of the matter, uh, Steve. Like, what does all control means, right? Uh, because control can mean, you know, the physical access to to the to the data storage facility. You know, that's one way to think about it. Um, uh, another another way to think about it is, you know, the control means uh, the, the the company cannot use the data in 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 the same way as before, right? Uh, like, you know. Their usage of the data needs to be subject to the U.S. side of review or something. So, but 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 the punchline is we don't know what that control means. Yeah, because in terms of data localization, uh, even before Trump's executive order, uh, uh, TikTok already put everything outside of China. 
but uh, you know the 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 the, the Trump's exact order means that's still not enough. You know, you still need to have uh, another another layer of control with respect to to the data. It's not only just about keeping data out of China. It's also about uh, who can access it and and who can use the data and get the value of the data. Even though the the ByteDance investors were predominantly American. That, that's right. That's right. I, I believe, you know, General Atlantic is, you know, is a major investor there. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, they would, they would suggest uh, uh, at least, you know, uh, no matter what, we should get a term sheet. Because if we, if we don't have, if, we, if, the, if, the, if the app will be, it needs to be shut down as Trump initially suggested, then the, the valuation of it, like a 50 billion ish, will go to zero. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as we mentioned, we had a questioner from Microsoft and Rong Shi has asked, uh, how yeah. do you assess the impact of the incident that, Ch- that Chinese hackers compromised Microsoft Exchange? <laughs> Experts call this the second largest incident next to the solar wind hack of last year. Do you think cybersecurity will be an area that the Biden administration is going to compete, cooperate or confront China? Yeah, it's a, it's a, such a such a tough one. Now, first of all, Steve, you know, I, I was asked by CNN to comment on this. So, so first, so first, let, let me give you the comment I gave to CNN. Uh, you know, what, what I what you know when CNN contacted me, you know, I, I really find this is a thorny issue uh, because on one side, right, you know, Microsoft got attacked, um, and you know, you know, for such a such a big player, right? You know, if if they feel threatened it must be something even more powerful. So, so, so there's something there, uh, but at the same time, you know, Microsoft is still like expanding China, has significant business in China. Uh, so, so, it's, so it's a really a thorny issue. So what I, what I gave CNN was, was that the fact that uh, Microsoft is expanding its cloud business in China via a, a, a joint venture with a Chinese company Called a 21 via net, and, and actually uh, Microsoft is planning to expand uh, its cloud business in China in in the coming a year or two. Yeah. So 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 what I commented at CNN is that you know it seems that that Microsoft is actually continuing to cooperate with China, including data management and the cybersecurity, uh, cloud cybersecurity. You know that that that's a quote I gave right. Uh, now, now since it's today, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the end. So I, I, I go a little further. I would say uh, you, you could, you could imagine that in, in the context of this tech, tech competition that the, the, the Biden administration will take different approaches to different categories, you know, so, so, so for example, you know, relating to, relating to data, uh, probably it will be more of a conversation uh, to is more engagement to to figure out a a, a protocol for cross border business like the TikTok situation, right? Um, uh, then you know for some uh, for for some for some technologies actually you know the the collaboration may still be possible may may, may still be possible like for for example uh, semiconductor because uh, the global chain supply chain is so intertwined. I think you know they, they may come to some 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 uh, agreement, you know some some agreement. Uh, but for, for cybersecurity, I, I I think you know the Biden administration may take more confrontational approach. That, that, that's my guess. You know different categories, you know different uh, approach. You know confrontation, engagement, and collaboration for different categories. I should tell our listeners that the, the national if you go to the national committee website. We have a track through dialogue on digital economy issues where we and, and the Chinese, our Chinese counterpart, make recommendations to uh, the US government on how we should proceed in these areas. And that's all public and all available on our website. Uh, Fan Yang asks Since you mentioned China's use of the health code, could you talk more about the implications of the tech war, if any, for the management of COVID in both China? And the United States, as well as globally. Yeah, now the uh, I, I think it has several implications. And one, 
it is about the, the, the you know the balance between privacy and 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 the COVID uh, activities. Um, I, I think you know at the at the very beginning, you know, many countries uh, disliked this code idea, but now these days, more and more countries are talking about you know uh, so so called a vaccination passport, right? Passport with vac vaccination information and and medical history. Uh, so, so to some extent, you know, the, the, the China's health code provided this first trial uh, in, in this context. And, and uh, frankly, I think some of the countries will adopt it. Some, some countries may, may never adopt it uh, just because of the different uh, viewpoint. Uh, but I think another layer to, to, to this health code thing is, is about the digital identification going forward. Um, you know, beyond, you know, pandemic context, just normal life. Right, you know, this raised the question about digital identification. Um, uh, on one hand, you know, people, you know, uh, uh, you know, people still talk about the privacy issue, but uh, more and more, you know, especially relating to the crypto assets, uh, the more and more uh, uh, conversation about digital identification coming up, coming up. Uh, so the health code actually may be also a test for digital identification in the broader context. Like going forward, are we going to uh, uh, you know, mostly rely on digital format identification S since we have more and more activities going online and we're gonna have more and more assets online. So, so, as, so as Steve, I think you know, this, this health code uh, actually uh, is, it, it is more relevant you know, in, in the later context as we go forward. Yeah, um, which leads nicely to Leah Bordley's question, which, and, and you know, the at UN International Telecommunications Union for facial recognition, video monitoring city and ve vehicle surveillance is trying, they're trying to develop standards for surveillance technology. Chinese companies have been vocal in providing suggestions for global standards, but US and other democracies have been largely silent. What are the implications of this failure of the US to contribute to this global discussion and allowing China to set the standards for surveillance technology? So that, that's a great comment. That's a great comment. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, different countries may have different approaches, but uh, it, it, it will be, it, it's just, uh, you know, unimaginable that the US is no longer in the leadership position, you know, for the, Global thought, you know, thought leadership for digital economy. You know, certainly the, during the four years of Trump administration, there's very little development there, right? Uh, in, in terms of privacy, you know, the U.S. still does not have a federal privacy law. Um, in terms of antitrust, uh, the U.S. has no like meaningful actions against the big techs, right? And and, and in terms of like. In, in terms of antitrust legislation, you know, there's not even any discussion about about the new new antitrust thinking, you know, in, in the U.S. Uh, digital context. You know, lots of the, the existing U.S. antitrust law is still relating to like a price uh, uh, price rise. You know, the, the war, you know the, the the old antitrust thinking is is that antitrust will lead to price increase, right? But this doesn't apply to the, the, to the big internet platforms that build up their empire by giving free services, you know. Uh, so, so, so the U.S. is is surprisingly missing uh, from the uh, the new cyberspace governance discussion. I, I think this is just a fact, Steve. Uh, I, I give you an, a, a perfect example, you know, the the uh, about Bitcoin and uh, black uh, uh, Bitcoin and uh, Blockchain, you know, India is having the Bitcoin discussion at its parliament right now, right? Mo most likely, most likely, actually, probably it's, it's it's a sure thing now. Uh, most likely, India will go with the China approach. You know, say blockchain is a technology, but we're gonna prohibit all crypto trading, right? Uh, so, so you know, since we are still at the early stage of the digital economy, I, I think you know, if the U.S. is missing from the global thought leadership. The China model will take over. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, what do you think? Do you want to comment more on this, Steve? I, I think to some degree yeah. it's a reflection of the last of the previous administration not yeah. wanting to be engaged in international law uh, rulemaking. So I right. think partly that, and it's partly um, we have not been leading on this for for quite some time. But you mentioned India. Yeah. Obviously, India has now blocked uh, hundreds of Chinese apps as a result of the political situation between India and China, the death of of 20 Indian soldiers and four right. soldiers in the Himalayas. How much is that kind of relationship between China and others going to affect the abilities of its companies to expand globally? I, I think you know, the, uh, the, the Indian ban, banning you know, the China apps uh, is a very interesting reminder that there are still other other polars in the world, if you will, you know, Steve, you know, like people are so familiar with this China US digital war, but you know, uh, a lot of times we war we forgot right there's there, there are still a few more pillars out there. Uh, and I think, you know, as China US in the middle, you know, in the middle of this tension, you know, the, um, the third party markets will become increasingly important. Um, not only for the next billion users for the for the for the internet giants either in China or the U.S., but also relating to the to the future market standards setting. Yeah, uh, because you know if China and U.S. are not really trading to each other uh, in the digital context, uh, that that means you know more and more transactions will be with the third party countries, like especially the emerging markets, like the Belt and Road countries, right? Uh, so because of the digital Silk Road connection, and also because of like the singles day thing, you know, like when we talk about 200 countries participate in the 11, November 11 singles day, you know, that, that means, you know, like a, a lot of countries, right, are, are trading with Alibaba and China. You know, during this process, you know, uh, uh, China is also developing uh, cross-border transactional governance standards uh, with the third party countries. I think you know th those countries will be uh, will be increasingly important uh, in the context of China U.S. Uh, trade uh, digital war. Yeah, I mean today we had a meeting, uh, or it's scheduled or it's occurring um, yeah. between the the Modi, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, Japan, and Biden. Right. So it's very much you know think and obviously they didn't say it's about China, but I'm sure China. Exactly. Important All right, we have a very few minutes left. Let me quick quick answers to these. Uh, Ethan yes. Goldings asks, Kai Fu Lee makes the argument that China is already so far ahead of others in terms of AI implementation, as opposed to research where the US is still leader, that other countries will never catch up. Do you share that assessment? I, think I would say half and a half. Yeah, you know, I think that Kaifu's belief, Kaifu's thinking was, you know, was mostly relating to that, uh, Kind of uh, the, the positive feeding cycle of data, right? You know, the you know for for most of uh, for lots of the AI, you know, the more data they have, you know, the, the, the more training you get, you know, the better the algorithm, you get more users, you get more data, and as the cycle uh, repeats, right? So in that case, uh, you know, he he argues that China has that data advantage, and that advantage will just compound, become even bigger. I, I think that's one side, right? But you know, the the, the other side of the equation is, you know, we. Uh, uh, we, uh, there's always more innovation in the algorithm itself. So down the road, data may not be the only determination uh, for algorithm. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Jay Wong, and because your book, your book does cover this, so I want to ask the question. Jay Wong asked about the yeah. digital agricultural economy, and that's been prioritized by the Chinese government, but obviously talk very briefly about how blockchain will play a role. Th th that's right. You know, uh, actually, that's the new frontier of Chinese digital economy. You know, last year, the, the number one, uh, uh, the, 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 the number one policy from from China's central government at the beginning of 2020 was about digital China. Uh, you know, the, the, the background of this is even though China has nearly one billion dollar and uh, one billion users, you know, that also means like uh, you know, uh, near nearly half a billion people. Do not even have the basic internet connectivity, and most of them are in the rural area, right? So, so the so the uh, uh, so so the digital village, you know, for the for the most part, is to 
get those rural farmers into the digital economy because otherwise they lose a lot. And so, uh, you know, so that's the fundamental thing. And now on top of that, right, you know, you can talk about uh, uh, turning farmers into, into entrepreneurs, you know, they can become e-commerce entrepreneurs themselves, or you can say, uh, you know, they, they, they can use digital technologies to improve their productions, right? For example, uh, use blockchain to track the, the chicken's growth so that people can be sure that the chickens are truly organic, or, you know, they can use AI technology uh, for plantation, you know, like Pinduoduo, uh, you know, the, the e-commerce company, you know, they last year they sponsored a, a, a strawberry plantation competition and the AI team actually beat the traditional team uh, by using new technology. So I think there's a lot of room for development there. Yeah, well, it's a perfect way, you know, yeah. this hour has gone by so quickly, it's hard to imagine we we're already out of time, but it, it really gives you all a taste of, of what is in this book. The Digital Wars. It's a wonderful read. This has been a wonderful hour. Winston, I can't thank you enough for writing all of these great books, which we all thoroughly enjoy. And somebody kind of, you know, splits his time and expertise between, you know, investing, lawyering, yes. and educating Americans and Chinese about the future. But thank you so much. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Buy the book. You can, it's, Posted how you get it on our uh, on the chat right now. Thank uh, you, much appreciated, and I look forward to more discussions. Me too. Thank you. All right, bye.